what, what, what I was going to talk about was this rationality and irrationality. So this was start with about pigeon and blood and doctors and whatnot, and how we will uh, tie up the story, I'll talk about that. So <clears throat> this is a patient that uh, I saw a few years ago in her 60s. She came in with a weakness on her right side, and that was a stroke. And you see the red arrow that's pointing to that area of the brain where that little blood vessel was blocked and that part caused a damage which led to this weakness. She was not getting better so fast. We got the MRI. They decided to actually do something else. Now, we know that scientifically that as the blood st stops to flow from uh, in those blood vessels, that part gets damaged. The other part of the brain starts to pick up. If it's a big stroke, then it's a much worse story. They don't get better right away. It takes a much longer time, and there's still a lot of deficit. In her case, <clears throat> it was taking some time. So what they did was they went to something very interesting. They said, we are going to get these white pigeons. And they had heard about it, that if you use that white pigeon blood on your stroked body part, it gets better. And lo and behold, she did start to get better over time. So in about six weeks, eight weeks, she had improved significantly. Every day, she was applying these white pigeons, and they were going for the white pigeons with those red eyes, especially. Because apparently, these animals have warmer blood than the other pigeons. So they were using those white pigeon bloods applying it on their arm and leg, on the right side, on a regular basis, eventually she got better. So this is all true. But where is the fallacy? The fallacy is the connection that it was the white pigeon's blood that caused her to get better. And that is a problem, where we connect things together where there is no connection. So it is known that these patients who have these kind of strokes can get better in about four to six weeks, maybe a few months, maybe four to six months, or maybe a couple of years. And about 60 to 70 percent of patients do get better. So if instead of using the white pigeon's blood, she was taking this mint chutney every morning and every evening, she would have gotten better. And she would have said that, oh, this is what caused me to get better. So the correlation was where that was false. The problem is this is. These things, when they come together, scientific basis and, and rubbish and nonsense, when they come together, that leads to pseudoscience. So pseudoscience surrounds us completely. But the problem is we have other, pro other pseudoscience problems that surround us, and it is very difficult to understand where is pseudoscience and where is real science. So some of these great writers, Michael Shermer and Thomas Kidda, and these are two of the great books that uh, they have written, talks about what is the reason. And it, there's a problem in the thinking, the way we think about things. And those basic, there are six basic reasons that we think wrongly and we believe what we think is right. And that's what leads to pseudoscience and superstitions and things like that. So well, number one is the statistics versus the stories. So our mind, our brain is tuned to believe in stories, in anecdotes. We don't really look at the statistics. As the brain, human brain evolved with the human being, we were limited to small families, small tribes, small villages, small herds. We were not looking at the whole population and looking at the statistical data. So the brain evolved with that understanding that if somebody tells me that don't go to that end of the swamp because your uncle died over there and there's a demon over there, you better believe that. If you don't believe that, if you're going to test it on your own, you may die too, because there's something wrong over that, at that swamp. So we, we came up with this brain. It evolved over time to believe in stories. And the stories stick to the brain much better. Statistics, it took much longer time when the data started to come together, when mathematics was applied and all those things happened, that we started to have a statistics. So anecdotes is what sticks to the brain. And anecdotes are the basis of irrationality. If you believe in anecdotes, they will mislead you, they will misguide you. 
So nothing blinds intellect more than the anecdotes. And that AE over there is not Albert Einstein, it's Atharinam. So, <laughs> so the problem is the anecdotes is you tend to see one thing and you make up your mind that this is what it is. That's the problem with the anecdotes. The other, the, the other thing that happened with these anecdotes was there was, I, some of the audience is very young over here and does know about this breast implant story that happened in the 80s and 90s. And you know, there were a lot of women who were getting breast implants for cosmetic reasons and, and whatnot. And what happened was that these, pa these uh, patients started to have some problems, which led eventually to such a big massive, uh, class action lawsuit that the company that was making these implants eventually went bankrupt. Now that was all anecdotal. The FDA, the lawyers, the judges, everybody was just looking at the anecdotal stories. The scientific evidence was not existent that actually these implants caused those problems. But then, this is what happens in witch hunt also. This is what happens when we start to think and say, hey, hashtag me too, and things like other things that happens when really it's not there so much. There are some stories that about the child abuse by the parents. That was also one of those things, that everybody started to jump on that bandwagon. So anecdotes is something that we need to be very careful about. The other thing is confirmation bias. So it's interesting. We think that we think logically. We think that we look at the evidence and we say, huh, this makes sense, this does not make sense. I believe in this, I don't believe in this. That's not true. What happens is that actually you make up your mind with your biases and prejudices even before you start to look at the data. And once you have that, you then you start to confirm whatever you believe in, and that's called confirmation bias. That's, and that's so amazing that you actually in, do not look at, you, you ignore a lot of data points because you believe that this is true, so anything that comes and supports that, you take in, that into account. And this confirmation bias was actually talked about back in 14th century by Ibn Khaldun in his book, he, he actually writes a whole paragraph on that one. And then Francis Bacon also talks about 16th century. And there are a lot of uh, you know, intellectuals who have talked about these things. The third thing is the randomness. We are not aware of how much the chance in randomness causes a problem. The randomness does affect our life so much, but we think that there's a cause and effect relationship. There's some, there's some line, some direction that's happening. And that randomness can misguide us. So there was this study done in a European country where they said, okay, those people who are living near these high tension wires, do they get into some problems? And they looked at 800 parameters. And they found that yes, the childhood lymphoma was occurring at a much higher level in those people who were there around, the, around the, these high tension wires. Now step back, think about it. Looking at 800 parameters, their randomness suggests that there are chances that you will find something that will have a higher incidence. So that's where the randomness comes in. And that's an example of a, the fallacy of the Texas sharpshooter. So this is a, it starts from a joke actually, that you know this Texan, he picks up a gun from a distance and fires few bullets on a barn wall. And then when all those are there, then he goes there and says, okay, these are together, he draws a circle around them and says, I was pointing to that one. So I'm really a shooter. But this is how our mind also does. It, 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 it behaves like that. We behave, we look at the random data and say, ah, no, this makes sense, this is what it is. We have to be careful about that one. And we get fooled again and again. Our brain is just wonderful in fooling us. So our memory can be faulty, our perception can be faulty. It's a known fact that you know, whatever you think that happened might not have happened. Your memory was constructed after that. And similarly, when it's the perception of things, so think about it, if you were born in 11th century, there was this concept of geocentricity. You would wake up every morning, you would see sun arising from the east, settling in the west, and you know, it's happening every day. And then you say, yes, of course we are the center. Everything is moving around us, right? So why would anybody think of that, you know, we are not this, we are, we are actually rotating and you know, everything is still over there. So the per our perception can misguide us, and we have to be careful about that. The flat earth, you look at the earth and it's all flat, 
Why would you think that's round? Right? And it's amazing that there's a flat earth society that is still there. You can go and look at that website. And I was amazed that one of the doctors from one of the medical schools where I graduated from believes in flat earth. And I just couldn't convince that gentleman that this is not, the earth is not flat. So, <clears throat> so we are surrounded by astrology. Ronald Reagan was into astrology, Nancy Reagan. We are surrounded by exorcism. We are surrounded by palmistry. We are surrounded by exosensory perception. We are surrounded by this Reiki therapy where you have these waves and then, then spoon benders and, and whatnot. So we're surrounded by all these things. And do we remember this story about this uh, water yeah. running with the car? How many people? So did anybody think that there was something in there? We should have considered this or not? Not really, right? So we are rational thinkers over here, most of us, or almost all of us. But then if you remember the whatever happened in the media, there was some of these so-called scientists they were saying, no, there's something serious in it. We should think about it. We should look at it. And I, that was very dismaying, very disappointing, that a scientist, a, a high status scientist in, in our country is saying something like that, that there's something. It is, it is really impossible to happen because there's just some basic laws of thermodynamics. And it was contradicting those laws. <clears throat> and it's not only them. So this is a picture of. Uh, what came from fairy hoax. So these were uh, two girls, age 9 and age 16, and they said that we actually played with fairies. And Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who is the great rational logical thinker, who wrote about all the Sherlock Holmes, he looked at these pictures and he said, I, this evidence is enough for me to believe that there are fairies. It only turns out that these were hoax, and these girls, when they grew up, they eventually mentioned that, that you know, we actually cut out cardboard pieces and we put some pictures on it and it happened. So, so, so our mind can get fooled because we believe on something and we just accept. <clears throat> and not only that, there are scientists in this country who are at the top level who will make the policies about science who believe in these kind of things. I was sitting in one of the presentations and I saw this and I was aghast with terror that, you know, what, are the, what is he talking about? So we are looking at how these picture, the shape of these walnuts looks like a brain, so walnut is good for the brain, and the heart has red and is like all these chambers, so it's good for the uh, tomato is all that, so it's good for the heart. And then uh, we have this carrot. So actually there is some science behind it. So carrot has vitamin A, which is good for your vision. And, and, and tomatoes have these lycopenes in there, which is good for your heart and other part of the body. Right? Walnuts have some alpha um, omega uh, fatty acids, which is good for your brain. But then, you know, putting it together, the real science with, the, with this irrational thing makes the pseudoscience. So there are about $10 billion, more than that, is spent on these pseudoscience-based alternative medicine. The problem is the alternative medicine, we don't reject it as such, because there are a lot of things that in nature is true. So we, if we do that, that's a non-scientific way of looking at things. That, oh, there's alternative medicine, this is wrong. If you look at the foxglove plant, William Withering was a botanist, and he actually looked at it. In 18th century, there were patients who were coming with a heart failure, and they were getting all these swelling in the feet, which was called dropsy in those days, edema nowadays. And these patients were, couldn't be treated. But then there was this woman in the uh, West Midland of England, she had this concoction of some 20 things together, which was improving them. So this botanist, William Withering, he looked at those and figured out that it's the foxglove plant that actually was doing the trick. And from there on, it took him nine years to figure that out. And then the digitalis medicine is one of the most commonly used medicine in the world for heart failure. So similarly, our great scientist, uh, Salim Muzama Siddiqui, he looked at the neem tree and there are a lot of folklore about neem tree, but there are chemicals in there that are actually scientifically proven to be antibacterial and, as a pet, and they're used in pesticides. And there are a lot of stories about uh, cinchona bar making kunin and aspirin and things like that. And it's not only the pseudoscience and all that nonsense and rubbish is limited to what we call as alternative medicine. In the, in, the, in the world of real medicine, there's also a lot of rubbish and nonsense that stays there. And we have to think scientifically. So we talked about that stroke patient. And 
for that stroke, there were a lot of surgeries that were being done because one of these arteries going up there can get blocked by small plaques. And if you remove those plaques, you think that they'll open up the arteries. So people were doing left and right these surgeries, what we call as carotid endarterectomy. So in what you do is you open up the artery, you take out the plaque because they think that there's something coming out from that plaque that goes in the brain and blocks the arteries. It turns out doing some scientific studies that that is not true. Only in a very few cases that works. So they define criteria. Those studies are called randomized control trials. There were several of those randomized control trials that occurred. And the randomized control trials are the scientific basis of modern medicine and surgery. So at the one end, we have anecdotes. Maybe this medication worked. At the other end, we have this big scientific study that suggested, OK, it does work, because we have done it in a double-blinded, randomized way that this thing is effective. So this is the scientific way of looking at it. But then there's a lot of quackery in, in the field of medicine and surgery. There's a lot of cognitive bias. There's a lot of um, uh, uh, conflict of interest. A surgeon always wants to do a surgery. And it always make, make up mind that, you know, I think the surgery is going to help the patient. But the data has shown that it is not probably. There are a lot of medications that are being used which are not true. So one has to be careful about that. So the pseudoscience is a combination of all these things the ra irrationality that is built into it. What is the evidence to the claim is number one that we have to understand. When you say something, it works, or this is so, what is the evidence? Is there any alternate hypothesis? That's another thing that we have to remember. And, re and But do remember that if you do not have evidence, you are not disproving that. You just do not have evidence to prove it. That's what it means. You're not disproving that. So this is the way a scientist should think. In a real in a real scientific world, as a real scientist, you, are ba you, you progress on three things. Basically, one is curiosity. You're asking questions. And number two is, you have to have some testable hypothesis. And number three is, obviously, that you have to have no dogma. Science is the most humble of all things. I believe in something based on science. You prove me wrong. I say, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Let's go this way now. And that leads to a skeptics. So skepticism is something that is looked down upon. It has this negative connotation in most of our minds. These are the skeptics from recent past. You have to be skeptical. You have to question. You have to say, what is your claim for this evidence, for this belief? You have to have that in your mind. And one of the greatest skeptic is Carl Sagan, who really popularized science. That you know, for any extraordinary claim, for any extraordinary belief, there has to be extraordinary evidence. So <clears throat> how do you bring rationality in your, in, in your culture, in yourself, is number one. It has to be a culture of rationality. So it comes from peers. It comes from parents. It comes from people surround you and your family. Number two is, obviously, from the very beginning, you have to start to think in a critical way. You have to start to think in a rational way. And that's a training that comes in from that culture and family. And number three is lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of reading of all kind of stuff. Without that, you cannot have that rationality. So I'm going to end this talk with this. And it's, then, still, it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. Doesn't talk about ignoring it, rejecting it, just entertain it. Just look at it and say, what is the evidence? Thank you very much.